All right, everyone. I think we should, in the spirit of time management, oh no, should I not get started? Yeah, I, I can, we can wait. If you, do, you mean, do you mean to wait? Right. No, I know. Okay, so while, while the last scanning is still happening, um, if folks can just keep their phones up so that the scanning, we can honor that system that has been set in place for us. But we're... It looks like there's three phones. Oh, five, I guess. There's also two over here. While the last few folks are standing, we, uh, uh, getting scanned, we should, um, we should totally get started uh, again for the sake of time. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Beyond Diversity, uh, Race and Cultural Appropriation um, in Casting Practices. A lot of what we have to say today, just some quick introductory things. Oh, again, hello, my name is Isaac Gomez, Director of New Play Development at Victory Gardens Theater. And in just a moment, I'm gonna have a phenomenal group of panelists slash facilitators introduce themselves, but very quickly, just to center us in the space and what to expect this um, afternoon. I just have to say, you know, there's a lot of work to be done as it relates to equitable casting practices that aren't specific to race or cultural appropriation. Um, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot, especially, you know, regarding what the playwright's voices or word is, you know, looking at the circumstances around the Edward Albee estate, among many others. Um, but in addition to trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary pra casting practices, um, as well as uh, uh, gender equity um, and abilities and disabilities as well. So knowing in the spirit of that, we are gonna sort of try to center our conversation today as it relates to race and cultural appropriation. Um, some very quick things as well. Um, So why are we here? We've had this conversation a million times. For many folks, this is probably your uh, 50th or 60th, and maybe it's your fourth or fifth, or maybe it's your first, and if it's your first, welcome. We're excited to have you here. Um, a lot, often these conversations really center on a moment of catharsis and sharing concerns and opinions, and though that is very much gonna be a part of our work today, we really want this to be an action-based, action-driven moment for us as a collective to create um, a, a sort of a list of best practices as, as it relates to this particular topic. And with that, the, today's conversation is gonna bring about some potentially hard and for some harmful conversations. And so in that spirit, I wanna evoke some brave space agreements. I use brave instead of space intentionally as bravery allows for conflict with civility rather than agreeing to disagree because when we agree to disagree, someone always loses, right? And so, um, so in the spirit of that, welcoming that and also um, highlighting intention versus impact right, um, what you may intend may not be how that was impacted or received. And rather than allowing that to live or exist in a space, um, sort of letting us hash it out as a collective. Thank you. Great. Um, is that it? Oh, frame, framework format. So, what, what, so we're gonna just talk a little bit about what this means and what this looks like, and then we'll break out into our individual working groups. Um, and we'll talk, I'll talk a bit about those afterwards, um, but that will sort of determine, the, and then we'll do a report out where we can hopefully strategize and pitch this sort of list of best practices to the National American Theater landscape in hopes that this is, these are practices that we can adopt. Um, and knowing that there are obstacles in that way, we're gonna name those today as well and try to figure out how to move beyond them. So uh, before anything, now that I've said all that, all that stuff, I'd love for each of you to just maybe um, introduce yourself, um, your, your work as a practitioner, if there's an institutional organizational affiliation, what it is, and why are you here today at this session? Um, hi, I am Joni Schultz. I am the artistic director of Water Tower Theater, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
Um, previous to that, because I just moved there, I've been a uh, director in Chicago for the last bunch of years. Um, I am here today because uh, because since I've, I've gotten down to DFW, there's been a lot of discussions about this particular issue, and we hosted a discussion about this particular issue at my theater. Um, and I just wanted to sort of share what we've been talking about down in the Southwest. Hi, I'm Damian Jeter. Uh, I live here in Portland, and I am the black actor who was involved in the <laughs> Edward Albee <laughs> fiasco. So. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Roberta Pereira. I am the producing director of the Playwrights Realm in New York City. And I am here today because as a producer, I think that there is an important, we have a very important role to play in this conversation. And I want to continue this conversation with all of you here. Hi, I'm Amelia Costa Powell. I am the line producer at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival but um, up till two months ago was the casting director at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. And I am here today because uh, so much of this conversation often gets focused on casting. Um, so I am uh, excited to dive in. I'm Deb Clapp. I'm the executive director of the League of Chicago Theaters. We're a service and support organization for 250 theaters in Chicagoland. Um, I am here because um, uh, we've been doing this work in Chicago and because um, Alex, and, um, Alex Isaac and I have been uh, talking a lot about action um, towards more equitable practices. Hi. Uh, my name is Bijan Ngo. I am a TCG Round 10 Fox Fellow actor uh, based in Philadelphia with host company Lantern Theater. I am also a founding member of Philadelphia Asian Performing Artists, and ED and I work is a, a huge part of the mission of what I do as an actor and community organizer. So that's why I'm here. And I'm uh, Reagan Linton, and I'm an actor and also currently artistic director and acting executive director of Family Theater Company in Denver, Colorado. Um, and I think I'm mainly here because I believe that Inclusion and diversity is one of the greatest assets we have yet to mine in American theater. Um, I don't see it as an obligation. I see it as a major untapped asset. So I'm very passionate about talking about that. Wonderful. Um, feel free to just hold on to the mic, Amelia. Amelia. Um, because, you know, one of our first questions is centering around language. You're hearing, you know, we're hearing, we keep hearing these words, cultural appropriation, et cetera, and sometimes we're not quite sure what that even means. And the work, and that definition often sh 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 it changes meaning depending on the production or play you're working on. Um, and so, Amelia, can you talk a little bit about the handout that you've got? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so s some of you, hopefully most of you, have a handout. I'm sorry that there weren't enough copies, but I hope everyone can bravely share with a new friend. Um, this is a document that, um, was created by myself and a couple of collaborators from the DC theater community after a meeting of the DC Coalition for Theater and Social Justice where um, questions around this issue were raised uh, and many voices asked, well, can't we just all agree to some best practices? And um, in fact, partly inspired by the movement in Chicago around Not In Our House and um, creating kind of a, something folks can sign on to like that. Um, I will just give the caveat that this is a living, breathing document. By no means are my collaborators and I authorities on anything. Um, we're just really uh, passionate and we want feedback. So um, I hope that you will all help us to develop this document. Um, you'll see that the front page has some vocabulary, some working definitions. Um, you will also notice that uh, cultural appropriation is actually not one of those working definitions, and that's something that I know uh, we're going to talk about today, about um, establishing a definition for that term. But, um, but some of these words might be helpful to our discussion. Um, and uh, I will say that this document assumes that you agree that this work is important um, and that you're familiar with concepts around um, actually diversity and inclusion, uh, implicit bias, prejudice. Um, so if, if this is like 
totally out of left field and you're like, I don't agree with any of this, awesome. There, there's probably a need for a primer to even this, um, which we can totally talk about. But this is a, a quick uh, document with, like I said, some useful vocabulary and then diving into some suggested be best practices. Um, also, this document exists digitally, and if folks want to, uh, that version for the future and or want to make some suggestions for edits, um, feel, please feel free to email me and or engage in a conversation today and throughout, throughout the conference. Thank you so much. Um, so my first question for all of you is, if you could define cultural appropriation in one breath, how would you define it? What is a working definition we can create for ourselves in this moment? And anyone can start. I'm happy to start. I feel like I've been holding the floor, though. If no, if nobody else Go wants for to. it. OK. Um, for me, cultural appropriation uh, means <coughs> co-opting specific identity um, factors, practices, ideas, um, or images for uh, personal or commercial gain. And I think um, basically one of my best practices on here um, helps define how to not do it, which is cultural appropriation for me is not being conscious about what is the story you are telling, uh, are, is that story appropriately complex, and do you have the right players in the room to tell that story? Great, thank you. Maybe we go Deb to Reagan and then come back. Sure, I would agree with uh, what Amelia said and also um, I think it's about uh, the, I I in reference to the story, right? It's about um, telling the story. Um, it's not appropriating someone else's story, essentially, is, is my take on it. And it's also um, about um, it, but it's not about not telling that story, it's about um, digging deep to find um, what the story really is and what is, th what is um, and, and finding the people who can best tell that story. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's it. So I think you ladies have covered the bases, but I think cultural appropriation for me is often cherry picking, conveniently cherry picking what you like from whatever culture it is to make the story that you wanna create look and feel good for your own aesthetic without actually uh, connecting with the people from that culture and actually understanding uh, on a deep level what those, what those selected narrative items are. For instance, costuming, uh, language, uh, set, uh, movement. Um, a ton of people go and study Suzuki training and put it onto a piece of Shakespeare, but don't necessarily understand the culture from which Suzuki <laughs> was derived or why, or why they're using it for a piece of theater. Uh, but I'm, I digress. Come talk to me. <laughs> yeah, one piece that I think is very important is investment, um, where you, you use a culture, but you don't invest in understanding, understanding that culture, bringing that culture um, into the process. Uh, so I think largely it's about a lack of investment in, in the overall expanse of that culture. Yeah, and to add to that, the, the thing about investment is also, I, is it, how are you gonna continue investing on, on these people, this population? It's like, are you the theater that does the one black play on February during Black History Month, and then you kind of don't talk to those communities until you need those audiences to come back the next year? So it's also about continuing the conversation and not just having the conversation with one piece and then forgetting completely about uh, those people. Um, I think it has to do with exploitation, um, almost to the point of choosing aspects of another culture and almost making caricatures out of them. Um, 
in a in a way that is uh, disrespectful and you not being able to connect the actual meaning behind this certain thing and just sort of using it because you want to. Um, I think they've all been really great definitions. Um, <laughs> it's hard to be last. Um, but uh, uh, I think just in this context of casting, I would just say specifically that it is performance of another person's culture, simply that. And especially like the superficial putting on and kind of wearing of someone else's culture. Thank you. Um, let's, let's start getting a little personal here and naming some examples in which that has happened in our American theater landscape. Um, some of you might be familiar with your own circumstances in your own region, um, and if not, have definitely seen some things transpire in the media. Um, for us in Chicago especially, is, it has been a huge point of conversation. And most recently, Damien, the circumstance surrounding um, your, uh, 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 the, cat, the Edward Albee situation. So I'd love if everyone can talk a bit about how or what, in what way have you experienced um, seen or witness cultural appropriation in your own region, in your own work? Um, so this is a really interesting question for me, and that's how Isaac and I got in the conversation about my being on this panel, because I'm new to a community um, that I don't know very well yet. And, um, and I've been working at Victory Gardens Theater and working in, in the Chicago theater community where we, t where we speak about these things a lot. But um, I, having recently moved to Dallas-Fort Worth, there was a, there is a theater in Dallas-Fort Worth that recently um, a musical was created about a Native American <coughs> chief, and there was a lot of Native American characters in it. And my understanding is, although I don't actually really know this theater very well, that um, that the lead actor was white, and everyone who was playing these characters are white. And it, a big Facebook discussion broke out about it, um, which was really actually incredibly exciting to me. Um, there were like 800 comments, um, and DFW has its own Facebook page that everybody got in this big discussion about, and I sent it to Isaac, like, look at what's happening. <laughs> but. Um, in that, also, a board member let me know that my theater was being called out because we had done a play um, in January in which the lead character is deaf. And it was not a deaf actress who played the role, but there was a deaf actress in the show. And I think that the director had an idea about you know, creating a conversation around that that then wasn't really fulfilled and she'd felt quite hurt about it. And she actually said on this Facebook post that she probably will be blacklisted from Water Tower Theater and she's scared to say this, but she's gonna say it anyway. So I of course wrote her right away saying, oh my gosh, I, I don't want you to feel so powerless and so fearful that to speak out, of course you will be invited back at Water Tower Theater, of course you will. And that really, what I was excited about about the conversation is that people were being very brave about having it. People were asking a lot of really smart, thoughtful questions and were just really confused about what the lines were. But the thing that really bothered me is this culture of fear that actors feel afraid to speak up and say, you know, I'm not really sure about what this theater is doing. So we hosted a, com a community conversation, a town hall, um, based on one that had been done at Victory Gardens in Chicago. Um, where we just discussed this question, and it was it was just it w to me it was really exciting to be in a in a group of really diverse artists who really want to talk about this and start figuring out how to affect change in that community because it's it's quite a big and diverse community actually down there and um, and so I, I'm excited to be part of that as they begin that journey. Thank you. Um, I could talk about the I'll be the situation. Um, but just speaking more generally, um, I can think of times where I've been in auditions and somebody would say, could you do that a little bit more, you know, like a thug or something like that, you know? So, I mean, that's happened a lot. I also sing opera and I'm, I'm struggling with um, the, the opera Madame Butterfly um, because it's, it's an incredible piece of music just as a whole, but Every time a company does it, I'm always like, uh, are they really doing the right thing? You know, I feel like that is a huge um, example of appropriation. 
So because I work in New York, I could give a bunch of examples of pretty <laughs> much any company that <laughs> does theater in New York. Uh, but I'll use one from kind of my own backyard. As I said, I work for the Playwrights Realm, and a few years ago we did this show called My Mayana Comes that was actually directed by Che Yu from Victory Gardens. And it was an incredible production about an, a, a very interesting play. This was before my time there, but I saw the show about uh, some undocumented busboys that worked in a Upper East Side restaurant. Uh, in this play, the playwright had worked at a restaurant like that uh, for many years and actually used that as the basis. But she was a white woman writing this play about mostly Latino and, and one black man. And so there was a very interesting conversation in some of the communities about what, you know, was she doing the right thing? She was, was she bringing up, she did have this experience, but then she was showing other people, like there was no white woman in that play, you know? And so I think that that was a very interesting, and Che, of course, was part of this conversation too, uh, very interesting layered uh, conversation that still continues to this day. I too can think of lots of examples from m what I still kind of think of as my theater community in DC, but also nationally. Um, in terms of my personal experience as a casting director, I, I often came to a head with this when uh, lots of smaller theater companies, well actually and larger, it's not even about smaller, um, who either didn't have a, a, a resident casting director or for whatever reason that person didn't have this, the resources I had would turn to me to say, hey, we have this play and there's a Chinese character, like can you send me a list of Chinese actresses? And I felt torn because um, it's actually not my job to cast shows at other theater companies that don't pay me, um, but because that, that's my art and I deserve to be compensated for doing my art. Uh, however, I also felt like if I didn't provide that list, I was gonna go see that play later and that role was gonna be filled with a white person. Um, so that, that level of uh, responsibility to the community to uh, make sure that no one can ever use the excuse, well, I couldn't find someone, um, was, a, was a frequent co internal conflict for me um, and kind of broke my heart any time that I went to see something that did employ uh, yellow face, red face, conflation of uh, different brown bodies representing other cultures um, and yeah, and felt like I, should I have taken some kind of action? So yes, lots of instances, again, um, seems like um, that's a common theme. Um, the things that stick out for me um, are the fact that, um, so we have these conversations in Chicago. Um, there are a lot of Facebook conversations whenever um, one of these casting issues sort of rises to the top, and um, they're great conversations they don't always result in um, growth or learning. Um, many times it results in defensiveness on the part of the theater or um, worse, silence. Um, I also think that um, there's some, in terms of um, uh, Joni's issue around speaking out, many times um, I see that some of the larger theaters are not called out um, and that um, is I think a result of people being fearful that they won't then be cast at that theater um, or won't work at that theater in any capacity. Um, and then, you know, finally, um, critics. Um, we have a critic in Chicago, a major critic, who um, during one of these controversies actually said it's called acting. Um, and so that's something that I just want to bring out there as a part of our discussion. So I come from a unique ecosystem of a theater community that's incredibly uh, loving. Um, it's, it's like a giant family. So I, my, mine's a, a really special case study, I think, because three years ago, my host company uh, for the Fox Fellowship, Lantern Theater, did uh, a Julius Caesar that was set in feudal Japan, and there were no Asian actors in it. And of course, the Asian community and a lot of other people were outraged. But out of that outrage came a series of conversations, not just with the leaders at Lantern Theater, but with 
other artistic organizations and other theater makers in Philadelphia about why did this happen and how often does this happen and how do we move forward making sure that this doesn't happen again and still honor, like still try to tell stories through specific cultural lenses without appropriation. And you know, the, the issue of, oh well, where are the Asian actors who are trained in this way? You know, uh, if, if B's busy, who's there to cast? And so I saw an opportunity to actually create that community of Asian specific artists. And I asked for help as an actor. And I went to uh, a couple of different organizational leaders in my city to try to find support, uh, to be fiscal sponsors, to get space and mentorship. And now, through the Fox Fellowship and through the past couple of years, with my city having people that are willing to do the work and have the difficult conversations, there is now space. There is Philadelphia Asian performing artists, but beyond that, there is a Latinx company. There are there are ways of building that rela those relationships, and I think it, it comes from these conversations and going back to your community and finding the people that can be your allies and taking it one conversation at a time. Because it's scary work and people are afraid to, to talk about race. And my biggest fear as an Asian actor is that theater companies refrain from telling stories through a cultural lens because they're so afraid of getting it wrong that they won't touch it at all. Mm. So I'd rather we sit down in rooms together and try to do it right. And there will be times when we do it wrong. I, I, you know, there are times when people look at a role I do, other Asian actors, and might say, why did you do that? That was, that was stereotype when I think it's coming from a place of love. So there are, there are times when I get it wrong according to other people. But I think, it's, I think we need to just keep talking about it and actually find agency at every le level that artists have agency <coughs> to create the change we want to see. And that I see people that can help me make that change happen in this room. <laughs> you know, and, and as organizational leaders, to identify the young people in the community of color that you think might need mentorship or that you're interested in helping along and seeing how you can help them tell their stories and their, that they're shared values. Any? Um, yeah, I think one thing I'd like to say is that I don't identify as a person of color, but I think it's incredibly important to have the conversation about racial appropriation, even as somebody who identifies as white, because cultural appro appropriation, it's cul cultural appropriation. Um, so the same principles are at play, whether you're talking about disability culture, about um, you know, a, a certain ethnicity, a certain race, a certain sexual identification. Um, so I, I just want to make that point that it's all the same. We're talking about, the, it's, you know, it, it's always the same in terms of cultural appropriation. Um, and I think in terms of missteps, the, the main overall misstep that I have such a problem with is when cost or ease or quote unquote like artistic quality trump authenticity. Um, that, and I've experienced that quite a lot in terms of disability identity is when they say, oh, there aren't enough people, we didn't have enough options, nobody came to the um, auditions, uh, or they weren't good enough. And that, those considerations are more important than putting something real on stage. Thank you. Oh. Thank you all for sharing that. And you know, um, the sort of last question I'm gonna ask this group before we begin the deep engagement process as a collective, um, and many of you are already sort of touching on this in our conversations of examples or missteps that we've seen is, you know, as I mentioned, I think it's appropriate when having these conversations that we recognize and acknowledge that they've been happening before, even if it isn't in formal settings like this, informally within theater communities, in private spaces, in quiet spaces, um, in spaces where folks may feel like they aren't gonna get fired or crucified or blacklisted from their theater communities because of their thoughts and feelings centering on this topic. And yet we can't quite seem to create a cultural shift. You know, um, it, it, as we begin topics of 
diversity and inclusion, they're, they're not feeling exhaustive as words, right? And that's sort of why we've called this beyond diversity, because we're not as interested anymore. And so the question I have is, what are those obstacles? Why do you think um, we haven't quite made that shift from conversation to action? And I mean that less metaphorical, right? I mean, of course, like systemic racism is real, and we can talk about that, why that's probably the main reason, but m practically, you know, hearing examples of actors' equity, for example, and inability to ask an actor how they racially, ethnically, or um, identifying their abilities as we discussed this morning, what are practical obstacles and reasons why we haven't shifted that culture, that, this paradigm? I guess I'll start, I have the microphone. Uh, yeah, I think it's already been mentioned a couple times, I think it's largely fear, and I think it's fear of doing something wrong, which is understandable, because sometimes wrong comes with consequences. Um, wrong can come with a lawsuit, and <laughs> that, that's fearful. Um, but I don't think, you know, I've been in situations as an actor where I've been told, well, we were just, you know, we didn't think we were gonna be able to do it right, and so we didn't, we didn't wanna do it. And I'm so grateful when people say, you know what, let's fuck up, let's get it wrong, and let's le then let's learn from it, um, as opposed to let's not do it at all. So I think uh, that's, that's the biggest obstacle I see is that people are afraid of, um, you know, uh, making mistakes. I mean, okay, so there's, uh, who can I speak to? I guess also, you know, I think there's, there's audiences that also expect to see certain actors that they love over and over. You know, like there are, are unofficial companies, even if you don't have a company at your theater organization. Um, <laughs> that are hired over and over, and that's great. That means you're taking care of the people who, who have been doing good work. But it also means when, you're, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, it means also being brave enough to create more space for the people who are not as often represented. Um, it means certain actors being willing to say, maybe I'll take, I won't, I won't even audition for that. I, I'll, I'll take myself out of that audition process but I'll recommend three names instead. Um, and it's theater leaders looking at certain people and saying, I'm gonna try to make a season that includes this, this group and that's not often represented on my stage. Um, so I think that's part of the shift in thinking is just intentionally making room and sacrificing space that you might often have as a benefit. So I was in a session earlier where somebody asked the question, um, what at, t at the TCG conference we are talking about EDI uh, almost exclusively. And when we're talking about EDI, we are not talking about uh, artist compensation. And, I, um, and the facilitator uh, said, we can't talk about anything until we talk about EDI. And I think that um, the barrier is that we have not yet learned how to talk about it. Um, I think we're learning in this room how to talk about these issues, but um, we have a long way to go before um, we actually have the language that allows us to really um, speak uh, honestly to, um, to this issue. And I, and it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not a reason to stop talking about anything, but, um, but I think that's one of our biggest um, barriers to action. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I would bring up two things, though I think there are so many that could be discussed. Um, one is, and this affects everything, but I think it affects this conversation, is siloism in terms of um, realizing what a collaborative and integrative art it is. Like, I think it's easy for, you know, actors to say it's on the casting directors. I think it's easier for, say, for casting directors to say, no, it's on the directors. I think it's easier for the directors to say, no, it's on the artistic directors, and the artistic directors to say, no, it's on the boards, and the boards to say, no, it's on the, you know, um, we all have to be doing it kind of at the same time for anything to actually get accomplished because the casting director can bring in a bunch of awesome options of actors of color and the director cannot choose them. 
or the director can choose artists and the artistic director can veto them. There's so many um, ways that just one player playing by best practices isn't going to actually activate a change. So I think the, that siloism is one barrier. And then the other thing I would mention is the, um, and this is just a subsection of systematic racism, but um, is the false dichotomy of this chicken and egg problem of there's not enough, like what um, I think it was B who already mentioned, uh, there's not enough uh, actors of uh, actors of color or actors with disabilities or whatever other identity factor um, who are coming out of certain formal training programs who that are established as if they as if that means something, um, and but then the training program saying well there's not going to be jobs for those people and we need the people that we bring into our training program to then become stars and give back. And um, again, in fact, actually both of these things have to happen at the same time and it's actually bullshit that anybody's pointing to the other side of that equation. Um, so I'm just speaking for myself here, but for me the thing that I've been seeing uh, over and over again is that I think sometimes we do get caught up in this language of EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it's easy to say, you know, just looking about the, the lens of race and ethnicity, it's easy to say like, oh, look how many women we have on stage, or look at this and look at that. And I think that it's time that, we, you know, we have that conversation in a more general way that like American theater operates under a white supremacist paradigm, like America. And like we need to start building anti-racist organizations, which is a very different thing than talking about EDI and, and, and having all of those those other th other boxes you can check. And so I think that those are very difficult and hurtful conversations, but we need to start having them and be very clear about the words we're using because they're very important. I just wonder um, who is having these conversations. Um, because it's most most of the time, I mean, you all are here, so I'm assuming that you have an interest in, in this topic and you're all woke and down for the cause. But the people who um, are really making the decisions, um, some, of whom, some of whom are in this room, but um, are normally, from my experience, white folks, and a lot of them are not sort of having this conversation. So it's almost like you wanna just trap the people who don't want to hear it in a room and say, listen to what we have to say. <laughs> because we pretty much are preaching to the choir and we just keep having the same conversation and everybody's like, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. But I can't do anything about it. You know, so I just wonder who's having the conversation. Um, it's interesting. I, I had several answers to this question, but the thing that's occurring to me as I'm hearing the rest of you guys speak is I wonder about the system overall of we pick a play, we have auditions, we see who comes, um, or we go out seeking these people. I just, I, I've been thinking a lot about this because in, in my new community, um, uh, an Asian American actor you know, called me up and was like, why aren't you doing any Asian American plays? And I was like, well, why don't we have lunch and talk about that? Um, and I w and he told me, you know, he's like, I know four other Asian American actors in town. And I was like, great, let's talk about that. And it's, I, I'm wondering if, if we should be thinking more deeply about the shows that we're doing earlier on also, and like who's gonna participate in them and who are we partnering with? We generally partner with a director and say like, go do this thing. But should we be partnering with actors earlier in the phases and like interviewing people and sitting down and talking to them more deeply is a question I have that's coming up from this. Absolutely. Um, and I think some really great key points to just reiterate in terms of what I'm, some collective energy I'm sensing from, from our, our group here is this idea, and you know, Damien, to your point, which is absolutely relevant and true, is large in part these convert, you know, when we think about the American theater and the American theater landscape, um, it very much does function on a hierarchical process unless the company itself is functioning as a non-hierarchical company in which funders, board of directors, and artists all share uh, equity and stake in the company, correct? And so for many of us, we think artists, like that's, that's sort of at the bottom. 
and then you've got your lower level staff, and then you've got your senior level staff of the company, then you've got your artistic director, your executive director, your board of directors, local funders, regional funders, and national funders, right? And um, many of these conversations might be happening on a more surface level, but like the deep and important work is something that needs to be investigated, and one in which we hope and you know recognizing and understanding that we're not coming out here with solving systemic racism in the American theater, but hopefully inspiring a conversation that many of you can and will have with your staff, with your board of directors, with your funders and philanthropers, philanthropists, um, as you continue on in your journey and in your work. I'm also sensing that some obstacles really stem internally from um, an artist and, and, and participatory point of view of fear. Um, this idea of shifting blame, and also that everyone has a role. And I think that's a great segue f sort of for the, uh, the, the next part of our conversation. Um, so rather than opening it up to group thoughts and feedback, we're gonna, go, we're gonna break into smaller, smaller workout groups um, to help ensure that more thorough work gets done. Your participation is crucial, and I'm excited for that. And uh, before, I, before we move, because there's gonna be some movement happening, um, I'm gonna sort of let you all know what's happening and then I'll reiterate it and then go again. So first, um, everyone, and I think, uh, B, I think you might have been the one who mentioned this, plays a role in this, including our audiences. And so I have a list of roles, for examples, that are uh, of, of, of roles we play in the American theater landscape and knowing that there's some folks that aren't a part of the list that I'm about to describe. Um, so. I need you, as I'm reading this list, I want you to just think for a second and identify for yourself the group in which you feel you most identify with or is most meaningful to you. Just one, okay? I'm gonna read it twice. Actors, casting directors, producers, artistic directors, playwrights, executive directors, marketing, development, and other arts administrative staff, institutional training and educational settings, and directors. So again, actors, casting directors, producers, artistic directors, playwrights, executive marketing, de marketing development, and other arts administration, institutional training and or education, directors. So what we're gonna do is um, each of us are gonna be facilitating one of these breakout groups, we're going to move, and we're gonna create a list of suggested best practices that you will want to uh, position to the American theater landscape and say, here is a role, here is how everyone can play a part in the role that we play, okay? So actors led by Damien, I believe, you're leading the working group, actors, don't move yet, I'm gonna tell you where, will be by this green exit sign um, then we've got casting directors led by Amelia, which will be sort of by this little lamp next um, to the left of this grand mirror situation. Um, uh, then we've got producers led by Roberta, and that will be by this sort of white pillar um, after these brown doors. And then we've got artistic directors led by Reagan, which will sort of be by this uh, glass window circumstance over there. Um, and then we've got Playwrights, which will be led by me at the second glass circumstance over there. Um, then we've got executive marketing development and other arts administration led by Deb Bravely um, over here by this brown door. Uh, we've got in, uh, institutional training and education led by B, which will happen by this lamp here. And then we've got directors led by Joni Schultz sort of by this uh, table glassware situation. Okay, and to our friends at HowlRound, um, we're just gonna pause as we do a 20 minute breakout group. We'll come back in 15 minutes for a group breakout and some takeaway steps, okay? So if we can all disperse, again, we've got actors, casting directors, producers, artistic directors, playwrights, executive marketing development, other arts admin, institutional training, education, and directors. And yes, please take your chairs if you can and are able, and if not, um, let someone know next to you who can help you out. Let's make a circle. Hello, hello, I'm so sorry. I know you're probably just beginning to dive in. As was the case with the playwrights group, we really only just begun. We do have to wrap up. 
as we can at least begin the process of um, sharing some things out. So I'm stalling because I know you're anxious, but we do need to get back to it. So if you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. If you can hear me, stop talking. One more time, if you can hear me, finish your sentence so we can begin the share out process. Wonderful. You don't have to move. We can, we can, we can stay where we are for this, for this portion of the share out. Um, so we're gonna go in order and, 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 and I'd love if every group can share a little bit about um, takeaways for that, that they'd like to throw out to the group that can be helpful based on the role that we adopted today. Um, and, then, and then we'll sort of wrap up a, a, a little more formally after that. So I'm gonna just, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know what's, I'm so sorry. I know this is not ideal to the, the live stream, but great. Oh, yes, that would be great. We start with the actors, actors. this thing on? Okay, there we go. Whoops. Um, so we came up with a, a couple of, or a few solutions um, that we would like to pose. And the first is to ask, am I right? Should I be here? And that comes from the perspective of, you know, if you're a person of color and it's a traditionally white cast show, you know, asking yourself, should I be here? And also, on the flip side, if you're a white actor and this uh, show is calling for a person of color, um, you know, should I be here? Um, the second thing is to have a conversation about the added value of different perspectives, and that, that should happen in the rehearsal room with the other actors. Um, it could also happen in the season planning room, and we also just broke it down to in the room where it happens. <laughs> a little Hamilton there. Um, the third thing that we have is audition with material that is from um, your own perspective and also diverse voices where um, it's appropriate. Uh, next we have is to educate, oh this kind of goes in with that, is to educate yourselves on, ourselves on what else is out there in terms of um, different perspectives of uh, different playwrights and things of that nature. Um, also to sit and talk with arti artistic directors. Um, uh, let's see, what does that say, stand up or something? Oh, and to also stand up for yourself. Self-advocate. If something doesn't feel right, you know, have a conversation about why that doesn't feel right. Um, and also, um, as more experienced actors, uh, we have sort of a responsibility to help the younger actors um, come along and also self-advocate if something doesn't feel right, but also to know, for them to know that what their values are going into the process and to stick with those values and to be very clear with those values. Anything I'm missing? Okay. Awesome. Thank you, actors. Just, just very quickly, because we're so, we, you know, because we started late time is of the essence. So if, for every group, if you can just shout out maybe the four or five top from your list, like the things that are crucial to exist in this space now, that would be awesome. And then we'll transcribe this and publish it on Conference 2.0 so you have it. And again, this conversation doesn't end here. This is just the beginning of what will be a larger movement, and you're a part of it. Awesome. Casting directors. Great. Um, we talked about more than that many best practices, but I'll try to keep it to the tops. Um, we, we had two levels of conversation going. One is about um, culturally specific work, and we talked about if you're going to program work that has identity specific uh, roles in it, that you search for uh, the right actors for those roles and you don't stop until you find them, which does mean allowing the appropriate time and resources to find those people. Um, and then on the flip side, we talked about if you're doing work that where identity factors are not germane to the storytelling, that our, our best practice is to open up those roles to anybody who might be the best, the best performer for that role, and that a best, some best practices to do that involve uh, forming deep and meaningful and ongoing relationships with the communities, the identity-specific communities that you're representing in those stories, um, to look at your casting as a whole 
once you ha have found your options and to be conscious about what story does that tell in terms of um, assigning roles to performers who maybe uh, aren't, who have identity specific, who have specific identities and making sure that that story is not coming from a white supremacist or colonialist perspective once you lay that all out. Um, and to use inclusive language in our breakdowns to make sure that actors know that they are being actively sought. So um, in terms of putting in your breakdown, if you're open to all gender identities, if you're open to all races and ethnicities, if you're open to um, you know, any range of ability, et cetera, any range of ages, um, to state that outright so that somebody, um, you know, a young African-American actress seeing that you're auditioning for Ophelia and Hamlet isn't going to just take herself out of the running assuming that you're probably gonna look for a white person. And then the one big question that we really wanna put out there that we discussed but didn't come to a one best practice on is uh, what level of granular do we need to and is it appropriate to get to when we talk about identity specific casting and authentically representing? Absolutely. Awesome. Um, next up we have our producers. Producers. Okay, so the first thing we established is that nobody really know what the hell a producer does. So it means we work all across uh, the organization. So our conversation became a little bit bigger and not just talking about casting, but talking in general about uh, cultural appropriation. Uh, so some of the main takeaways was uh, thinking about partner partnering when you partner with other organizations, especially if it's a bigger white theater, partnering with a culturally specific theater like who benefits, how can you partner and be equitable and responsible. Uh, also, connecting across departments within the theater, so there are access points. So for example, if you are trying to bring in a Spanish-speaking audience and then you have marketing material that reflects that, but the show is actually not in Spanish or doesn't have any way for people when they come to actually experience the show, that's probably not a great thing. Um, also thinking about uh, diversity at every level and not just thinking about cast, because that's obviously this was the focus of, of this general session, but we're talking about sometimes you can do a show and then you look at behind the table, who's sitting behind the table, a bunch of white people. So like how can we talk about that? And that includes our staff as well. If everybody that's looking at the material are people that we talked a little bit about how white is the default. So sometimes we see why, like we don't even see white as a color. And I think that has to do with the casting too, with the breakdown. If it doesn't list anything, people assume that's white, maybe. And so how can we kind of get out of that mind frame? Um, and then the last one, which I really liked, was be the squeaky wheel. Like a lot of these things happen, and a lot of people looked at those things and, and you know looked at those decisions. And so can you be the person? It doesn't matter where you are. Like we all have levers we can pull. We are all gatekeepers. Can you say, oh, are we sure about this? Shouldn't we think about this a little bit more? So don't be afraid to do that. Wonderful, awesome. Next we've got artistic directors. Okay, so we started off with uh, just challenges and you, you can look at those later through um, Circle 2.0. Uh, but anyway, possible solutions, anti-racism training, not diversity, anti-racism training. Uh, open to being called out or called in. Um, like the producer said, build relationships with other theaters and organizations or cultural organizations. Um, focus on underrepresented population playwrights, uh, whether people of color or women. Uh, um, uh, cast or audition people of color first instead of uh, at, at the end as an after effect. Uh, cultivate young um, persons of color through uh, school recruitment uh, and outreach. And uh, finally, that as an artistic director, it takes courage and perseverance uh, to go through this. Awesome, thank you. Next up, we had our playwrights group, and we were a small but mighty group for those who create the worlds of the plays, and some really quick, um, useful things. We're talking about it in two ways. One, were roles that aren't racially specified. How do we ensure that there's a multicultural framework um, some big takeaways are using development workshops as a way to un 
unlock or expand casting opportunities. So if we're, you know, we're working along outside of our that experience and creating a clause um, in your play or casting breakdown if your characters aren't racially specific that says um, we highly encourage multicultural casting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, when writing outside our own race or experience, uh, having actors read the play and create a space for honest and difficult feedback, having a dramaturg who maybe racially identifies with the characters in your play to read and give feedback, have explicit conversations and including in your contract um, a clause about pulling the play if and when those things are not um, a part of it. So not being afraid to pull the play when there isn't a multicultural framework or lens included in the casting practices. Um, that's a, that, there's a lot more, but we should move on. So we're moving on to the uh, uh, executive marketing development and other arts administrative staff. Thank you for remembering the name. Um, so we talked, to, I'm just gonna, we had a, a number of different themes. One of them was um, time and intentionality and planning. Um, and it was about making the space, even though it's very difficult um, we're all on very tight planning schedules, um, but some some of the people in our group have actually um, broadened their sense of um, what it means uh, to make a season in order to allow um, the space for um, the the thought that needs to go into um, uh, really doing it right. Um, another thing that came up was um, uh, the idea of training, but um, the, uh, that idea expanded to include um, opening up your theater to members of your community who may be interested in working in theater um, but never even really thought about going to Yale and getting an MFA um, and bringing them in and training them. Um, and um, one of our group actually has had um, great success and these actors are now uh, working other places in the community. So I think that's really important. Um, and um, the other thing, um, help me out guys, there was one more thing that was very important that we were talking about. Oh, um, who's in the room where it happens? Uh, and so um, it's, about, uh, it's about really diversifying your entire staff and um, not expecting, you know, you're going to do a play um, about a culture that's not your own, and only the actors are going to be of that culture. Um, but really um, opening up the space um, to allow um, uh, people of that culture to actually have um, some of the power. And finally, I just want to add, Pete wrote a micro festo, and it's awesome, and I want to ask him to read it. Yeah, so this is in case... Uh, institutional leaders won't listen to all the brilliant ideas generated here. Create higher integrity work outside the shadow of ossified institutions. Do it so well that the obsolescence of the ossified institutions becomes undeniable. Seize our pieces as we crumble. That's wonderful. I know we're just a couple of minutes over, but I really want to honor this space. If you can hang tight for just maybe three or four more minutes. We've only got two more breakout groups to report out. Education. We will be so fast because a lot of people actually had uh, the same best practices. Uh, so we talked about the university setting and uh, involve students in season selection. Talk to them about how they see themselves, especially if they're people of color or underrepresented, and center them in the work. Uh, clarify mission statement amongst the faculty uh, to reflect core values that have a commitment to ed &I work. Uh, connect students to professional mentors who are working in the field. Uh, so if you're an Asian student studying acting, to connect with an Asian actor working in another market and facilitate a, con a constant ongoing conversation between student and mentor. Um, so if they don't see themselves reflected in the student body where they are or in the faculty, they can see themselves reflected in the real world somehow. Uh, be transparent with students. Have the difficult conversations about the EDI work that are happening across the board in the field and actually offer courses about it. Um, and have those difficult conversations about casting with students. Uh, acknowledge assumptions. Ask your students to acknowledge, acknowledge assumptions. Have the conversations with faculty about acknowledging assumptions. Uh, encourage and teach students to generate work, especially if they are underrepresented in the plays that exist encourage them to contribute as voices. So playwrights, that's also something that is a best practice that we share. Uh, engage the community and seek actors 
uh, from the community if you cannot find them in the student body of students studying acting. Uh, they can train up, make room, make space. That's why it's a university. And finally, diversify faculty. Find ways to diversify faculty. Thank you. Thank you, education. All right, so in a, a Joni Schultz, expert report out extraordinaire. Wrap it up. Okay, so what we talked about directors. was basically on three different themes, directors, um, because as Laura Penn well articulated, we are the, we are the hinge between the producers and the, and the creatives, and, and we have to work on both sides. So we talked about um, bringing actors into the process earlier, whether that means workshops, whether that means developing work with them, talking to them in the room, actually having conversations instead of just auditioning them. Um, and we also talked about uh, going to uh, going to producers and, and insisting more on authentic casting and on working harder on casting. You, we could put it. We could put uh, things in our contracts that might say that we're going to uh, cast in diverse ways. We can get buy-in from artistic directors earlier. And then third, about what we're doing ourselves, uh, asking ourselves questions, knowing what we don't know, knowing the stories that we're really telling before we get into auditions. Those are, these are all awesome, incredible, and more and mostly realistic things we can do to ensure that cultural appropriation um, and racial equity in casting practices is ensured. I know today this moment felt chaotic, but I hope also exciting and motivating. Um, just so everyone knows very quickly, if, if, let's give our quick facilitators and panelists a round of applause. And if facilitators can just grab their notes and make sure you give them to me so I can transcribe them tonight so we can post them at your, on your 2.0 tomorrow so you have them and can read them on your lunch. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. This is just the beginning. Let's, let's make this a movement, not a moment. <laughs>